interviewing you. Let's just lay it down. I don't know. Oh, let's just fuck around. Yeah. Let's just do it. Peter Patter. Man, I feel bad that uh, we haven't been up to see the Fieldcraft Survival headquarters yet. You got a good setup, man. You shoplifted a lot. A lot, yeah. Um, you get an invoice for that. I wish I would have shoplifted all the rigs that you've got around <laughs> that place is what I wish we would have done. Did, did you see the right-hand drive um, Land Cruiser pickup truck? Yeah. The, the camel one? The uh, Toyota of War that you've got out front? Dude, it's my favorite rig on the planet, man. It's so badass. It's so fun. What's the story behind that build? So um, it's a. it actually is a Japanese fire truck. But in Japan, because they're little people, um, they use little vehicles to go down little roads. And so it's super <laughs> narrow. And it's funny because they, uh, I chopped the top of it, but it had enough room for the firefighters' heads, their helmets, the tall firefighter helmets, because they still wear those. And it was a Japanese fire truck that we converted into a um, FJ-75, converted into an fj I'm probably screwing that up. Uh, Land Cruiser guys are going to smash me. But it's a 79 series now. And so it's got a modern front end, but it's also a turbo diesel. So it has it has 200 miles on it when I got it. It's probably got 1,000 miles. And it's a 1994 Land Cruiser. So it's a brand new Land Cruiser pickup truck that we converted into a Toyo of War. Because we've all seen mm-hmm. oh, yeah. the most capable... Like, if it's good enough for ISIS, it's likely good enough yeah. for us. Philcraft survival, you know. So being a firefighter in Japan sounds pretty safe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Man, I did some training with the Japanese uh, when I was in the Corps. And did you know that they only have one contract that you can do? Like, when you sign up for the Japanese military, it's yeah. 20 years. Mandatory. What? There's what? no, yep, there's no four-year, eight-year, like, you're You in. don't get re-enlistment bonuses? Nope, nope, you sign up for 20. I don't want that. I don't think I would do that. No, no. I would never do that. So you're a lifer as you sign you're, up. You're a lifer from the get-go, yeah. Ooh. It's wild. That's crazy. But they probably only have like one MOS. Well, it was interesting because they were Soldier. still under the... <laughs> yeah. uh, Samurai. The, they uh, they have really awesome swords uh, that they get issued to them. I was always disappointed in the They get court. issued swords? No, they don't. I'm just oh, kidding. well, how racist of you. <laughs> <laughs> if you would have said that or chopsticks, I would have believed both. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't um when i was there training with them they were still under the 50-year uh contingent training that they were from world war ii yeah so they could do no offensive training whatsoever and so when we were doing t- tactics what? with these guys they were just pretty clueless when it came to doing anything offensive they had they didn't know how to conduct yeah. a raid or make a movement on an enemy force at all what yeah so there's something to that because I'm, you know, I'm a product of the Korean War, uh, 1950 to 53. My, my dad was stationed in Korea on the DMC, where he met my mom, and the Korea, the Korean War and World War II set up both of those Asian countries to thrive because they didn't have to worry about military defense. So when you're not worried about military defense and you could literally focus on your economy, your economy booms to the roof. So the, I think Korea it has the fourth largest economy in the world, or South Korea, and it's like that's what happens when you're singularly focused and you don't have to worry about defense. But I imagine... It's like Canada. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like can, Canada. No I'm one's going to fuck with Canada. That's true. You know Nobody. I mean? Like, it's a sore spot for me. I always get the ass when Canadians, like, shit on America. Like, they're like, oh, it's like... Yeah. You guys... Our neighbors. Your army would be done if, like, their van crashed. <laughs> so, fuck off. I don't think they're saying too much to that no anymore after what's transpired over the course Dude, of I, the I last couple years I can't believe that's a thing Canada. and nothing's been... Like, nobody even talks about that. You're like, how are Canadians not, like, just pouring over the border when all their freedoms are being ripped away? That seems kind of crazy. Yeah, it does. I'm going to make that t-shirt for you, though, uh, that just says product of the Korean War. Hell awesome. yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say issued chopsticks. Have you, <laughs> have you been back? Have you been to Korea before? So I, I have not. Um, no. I, I, I don't know if you know, uh, our media guy, John Park, was a former Navy SEAL in the Korean military. Okay. Um, which it always sounds like a punchline of a joke. And every time I say <laughs> that and tell somebody, everybody expects it to be a joke. And then he snickers because he he's, like, hates when I do that. And they were like, oh, so he's not? Like, it's a joke? I'm like, no, he legitimately was a Navy SEAL, 
But he told me about all of the culture stuff. He yeah. said it's kind of crazy, but I'd, I'd love to go. I want my kids to go. So, fun fact. like you, Mike knows my brother, Travis. We were Army brats. And uh, back when my dad was stationed there, it was an unaccompanied tour, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that one year. It's height of the Cold War. But yep. my dad was like, fuck that. I'm in Korea. I'm going to bring my family over here and let them like, hang out in Korea. Oh, that's so cool. So we lived like on the economy. Like We didn't live on base. We lived off base because yeah. <clears throat> there was nowhere for families to live. Um, and he just did it out of pocket, whatever. But I had a Korean babysitter. And by the time we left, I spoke fluent Korean. What? As like a fucking three-year-old. That's so rad. Wow, really? Yeah. yeah. That's rad. Yeah, I was like my parents' interpreter. Like, they would go shopping and shit, and my dad would be like, ask him how much that costs. And I'd be like, nah, nah, nah. Like, yeah. No really? way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty rad. Yeah. I don't yeah. remember any of it, but <laughs> it, it lives in there somewhere. Um, you pretty much are part Korean, is what you're saying. Yeah, basically. You know? <laughs> you, yeah, you, you can tell. You look very Korean. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I loved the, uh, it's like that, that yellow, that like pickled daikon cucumber. Oh, with like I got rice. it upstairs in the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> Delicious. I lived on that shit. <laughs> so good. Yeah. I would really like, I haven't been back like as an adult though. And I would love to go and like check out some of the like Korean War fucking battlefields and shit. It'd be awesome. I, I, the, the Forgotten War, right? I think um, a lot of people, they don't pay attention to this stuff anymore. I mean, the GWAT's almost forgotten about, right? But there's a lot of significant history from 50 to 53. But we were involved. I mean, it was a proxy war against China. And it was a really terrible war. I mean, dude, those guys were, our, our guys were suffering really bad. And if you look at the clandestine history of like the special operations that took place behind enemy lines, it was freaking crazy, man. Crazy. Airborne ops behind enemy lines. Yeah, so a little Easter egg here. I'm currently developing a series about Korean War. Rangers. Really? Yeah. Oh, so. hell yeah. Well, Easter egg, that's all I'll say, but it's going to be fucking yeah. rad. But yeah, the first Rangers to conduct an airborne operation were in Korea. You know, yeah. like in World War II, we were non airborne personnel. So, yeah, like all those combat jumps and just like it was like the birthplace of like really the modern Ranger, you know what I mean? Like the fucking the fire brigade, the guys that went in behind enemy lines and did the raids that like the conventional forces couldn't, you know. Yeah. World War II, they were, you know, they were commandos, but it was large, they did like company level operations and, and shit. It wasn't like, just down to the platoon and stuff. But yeah. Anyway, tangent on Korean War Rangers there. Crazy, man. Well, there's, um, there was, I think the first clandestine free fall operations were actually took place in Korea. Um, and if I remember right, I'm having trouble remembering the name of the book. Uh, White Tigers? No. Oh, there's a good one called White Tigers. It, it was, it was kind of based on the development of clandestine operations from World War II leading up to where it was. And it kind of, follows Billy Waugh's storyline yeah. throughout the whole entire thing. Um, but it, as far as free fall went, uh, it did not go well because they were trying to do some, some winter jumps in Korea yeah. and they just ended horribly. Yeah. They never recovered. A lot of them, they never recovered. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see that <clears throat> yesterday I saw one of the original two instructors, the military free fall course died. Like the oh. original guy, like there were two guys that started halo. Yeah. And one of those, I, I guess the other guy already died, but yeah. Yeah, when I went through military free fall school um, at Bragg, you, you started the first week at Bragg at the wind tunnel, horrible wind tunnel, because it pushed air through a net, and it was like open space, there were no walls, so you'd like throw yourself in the wind tunnel into like netting, and people used to get hurt all the time. Um, was there any walls at all? No walls. So it was like an open space. Imagine like... Uh, uh, like a net, like a like a cargo net, a fan pushing air through a cargo net. So it was, they called it like it's dirty air. Mm -hmm. And so when you got on there, you automatically started waffling. And even in a stable position where you're trying to become more stable, when you put on a ruck, forget about it. I mean, you were just out of control. So it wasn't like the tiny, like wire netting that you see at most tunnels. It was a cargo net. It was literally a cargo net. <laughs> and then it, and then every all the students used to hang around the outskirts to push you back into the wind as you were flying on the edges. <laughs> it was insane. That it was is insane. scary. Yeah, it's it like was super scary. It's like old days when you used to get in a fight and the, like, the, the circle of people around the fight would just <laughs> push you back, back in, in there. If, if it was away. crazy. It was, it, it was super, I mean, it was super like low budget. And then the original instructors there visited us during my class and their pictures from Vietnam when they had launched out guys to, uh, in free fall it, where they have like a, a guy in a black and white photo from Vietnam and like never recovered. 
you know, mm -hmm. MIA, and you're like, holy crap, man. Like, the dude's last picture is him getting rigged before going into a combat jump, and they never saw him again. Fuck. It's like, oh, shit, dude. And they were doing onesies and twosies yeah. with guys. It's like, dude, how sketchy is that, man? Like, and then you tack on to the lack of tech they had. Like, I would jump into a mission by myself. now, But, like, I have SATCOM and, like, a fucking GPS. Like, dude. here's your fucking paper map. I know. Good luck, bud. Yeah, I don't even Fuck. know if they had. Maybe they had boat compass technology um, to navigate, but it was super, like, I mean, it was just like a shot in the dark, literally a shot in the dark. The concept, when I went through military free fall school, the concept of jumping without night vision, I, what I was like, I was like, wait a minute, we, we're jumping chem lights? Like, that's what you're using as points of reference? Like, how do you land? And you land at half breaks and just eat shit like you're jumping uh, or PLFing, parachute landing falling uh, in a static line jump. But the evolution of that, like my first teams that were free fall teams, it was before we had mounts on helmets. So we had Gentex, what do they call them? Is that a Gentex? It's like a Gentex, like a bowling helmet. Oh yeah, oh. like it looks like the AC-130 crew member helmet, Yes, right? yeah, yes, yeah. it's like an aviator helmet. Yeah. And then there was no concept of attaching night vision. And the it's funny, because uh, this is before I became a free fall team sergeant a sniper reconnaissance team team sergeant. Um, I was in Afghanistan with RRD and uh, uh, Ranger, uh, Ranger, what is it? Ranger Reconnaissance Detachment. Yeah, Ranger yeah. Reconnaissance Detachment, which now became Ranger Reconnaissance Company, RRC. But all those dudes had pro techs and all the mounts. And I'm like, why aren't we doing that? I remember thinking as a young staff sergeant, like, why would we not put night vision on helmets? And it's because it just wasn't a thing. It's something yeah. we weren't doing. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you've seen that old video of the Russians doing their first jump training oh when they God. used to climb out on the wings. <laughs> yeah. And, jump, and just and fall like, off. There's like 40 of them just on the wings of an airplane. Yeah. And no just formation like, oh, in mass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty rad, though. It's pretty rad. So when, how old were you when you went through free fall? Um, when I went through free fall, I was 20, 26, 27. Uh, pretty young. A uh, pretty young SF guy. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's always fun. It, to, like, in, a, in an SF team or an ODA or, or SF group, sorry, like, there's a reason to go through free fall. But, yeah. like, in Ranger Battalion, unless you're an RD or RC, whatever, it was always just this, like, little thing they got you to, to re enlist with. Like, yeah. You re enlist, we'll send you to Halo school. And I always remember being like, I don't want to go to fucking Halo school. Yeah. <laughs> Why do I want to do that? The yeah. army ruins everything. Why would I want to go have that ruined by the army? Yeah, the the what I was like civilian freefall stuff, which you guys just went through the AFF stuff with GBRS. Um, when you go to a civilian drop zone, they just kind of put you in the air, and it's almost like you figure it out. And that phase or that evolution of training is real easy. But the army complicates it. Yep. And so you go there and you're like, they have you like day one in a classroom and you're on like, remember when you're in kindergarten and they have those little scooters that you sit on and then you go around like the cafeteria or the uh, PE. Yeah. They have you on that on your belly doing uh, arching and you're in the box man and they describe it in these different ways. And by the time you get to actually jump after a week of just pretending and a little bit of wind tunnel time, you're so paranoid that everything you're doing is wrong. And then when you hit the air, like the first couple of jumps, they almost failed free fall school because I was in a box man because they say, maintain that box man and you'll stabilize. Well, I was so rigid that I was waffling and I looked like a two boy by four flying out the back of an air aircraft. The old yeah. potato chip. The potato chip, just yep. waffling all yeah. over the place. I actually have my first jump on video. Uh, I posted that social media where it's like, I'm like geeking out because the camera's there. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be cool. And then I, go to jump out and just you know my my 13 size shoe and a danner boot <laughs> caught air and it just flipped me up and i was like a two by four a piece of plywood flying through the air and it's just a horrible experience man the army will f screw up everything there's a there's there's like a balance though because when we went through aff i remember they were like yeah you're gonna jump i'm like we're fucking jumping already like by ourselves like what i don't really feel super comfortable <laughs> like no absolutely and <laughs> I what think day was that what Two. Two. Oh, yeah. Okay. And that was only because we had a weather day. 
Yeah. We you would have jumped, jumped on day one? We would have jumped on day one. Yeah. yeah. We would have done like wow. ground school, then they required you to do a tandem, and then you would have done your, your first solo. Oh, so you guys all did a tandem? Yeah. yeah, it's like a requirement now. Yeah. Ooh. For for that drop zone. That's was. uncomfortable, man. I would never want to be tethered to another dude, depending on, you know, my life is on this guy behind me. I don't know. Yeah. And I'm sure they're the best in the world at what they do, but it's like, ugh. It that was just awkward weird. for me. It yeah. wasn't particularly scary. It was just like, this is weird. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just rubbing against you. Like, you're a little guy yeah, on a, like, a guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's so strange because it you're immediately a pilot. Like when you go through a pilot course to fly an airplane, like you have to do a ton of stuff before yeah. you're actually doing that. Ground and somebody's there and with you yeah. and like walking you through exactly what you're doing. When you're doing AFF and then after you deploy your canopy, you're essentially a pilot on a single wing, right? Yeah. And you have no idea. It's like, okay, you're gonna fly this plane, but you've never touched the instruments before. And yeah. now you have to, figure out how to get this thing on the ground and I look back on it I'm like man it it's crazy to think about the fact that you have to do all of this stuff with your life on the line for the first time and you've never done it before yeah you know yeah, yeah you you guys did and I think was it 11 days total thereabouts 30 yep. Yep. 40 11, jumps yep. you guys did that's what we would do because I went through basic free fall was three weeks I went through uh advanced free fall which was three weeks and then i went through free fall jump master which was three or four weeks and you guys did all of that in 11 days yeah which is yeah. insane yeah insane but i mean do you feel like you you actually and we're talking about the uh, the triple seven stuff do you feel like i can go anywhere in the world jump out of an airplane and be safe and, and do it and get it done yeah yeah, I, at least I, I want to believe that, or, or I have that that stupid courage, you know, yeah. that that it, it's doable. Um, and it, it's kind of one of those things like it's it's constant studying all the time. Like I'm, I always try and prepare for the worst case scenario, no matter what. So I'm like I'm watching the there's a series of videos on YouTube called Friday Freakouts, and it is every mistake that you can imagine that somebody makes in the sky and. 30 second to 90 second little little spouts and it's incredible uh what mistakes people can make and the what can happen like a lot of times you know people start free flying and they're sit flying and then their pilot shoot will just come out and, and so they're getting ripped out of the sky and you don't expect it um but it's really one of those things as far as the decision making process goes and, and getting good at making decisions on the fly i don't think there's anything better that you can do as far as training yourself to be confident in in your own decision making process yeah. is going through AFF and you know I'm I'm sure you know we we're kind of on this free fall stuff right now and it seems like it's kind of untouchable but it's really not like it happened uh Jericho and I were jumping out at Tooele here in Utah um a couple weeks after we went through AFF and I already had somebody come up to me who was a 0331 machine gunner and was like hey man I'd started jumping because I saw what you guys were doing on social oh, media cool. and started doing it. And he, he already had like 20 jumps out at the, at the school. And I think that there's so many things that you can take from the decision-making process and how studious you have to be, how disciplined you have to be in your day to day to constantly be ready to do something like that, that you can apply to your everyday life that will make you a better human in any type of job or occupation that you currently hold. Yeah. It's, um, and when we teach at Philcraft, it's, it's like this exposure. We call it operating the outdoors. But when you're willing to expose yourself to new challenges, that's when you see exponential growth. But also you see your resilience being built. Because it's not about what it is. It's about doing something that's outside of your comfort zone and the process. When you learn a new skill set, when you understand emergency procedures, when you actually do the experience, you start to build this sense of resilience that just makes you um, more adaptable which is one of the main characteristics. I think I think the most profound characteristic in survival is being adaptable. It's being able mm -hmm. to to shift and adapt and change um, through adversity. And um, like for me, I mean, I was a military free fall jump master. Had a sniper team. I didn't I didn't like jumping. I mean, jumping for me was so technical because I had to do all the jump ma master duties. I had to do all the spots. We we're jumping unknown, unmarked drop zones at night. So we're not landing on drop zones. We're landing in the middle of the desert doing link ups. Um, it, it was so consuming. And that that just kicked off the mission. That yeah. like 
like people spend so much time investing in that specific skill set, but that's just the very beginning. Like you have, you just began to now start the link up procedure to walk in and infiltrate into the target area. And that takes so much planning. And I didn't enjoy it because I didn't get the opportunity to like do Hollywood skydiving. Mm -hmm. This whole thing is completely different where I'm like, man, this is actually fun. And when you do it with friends and you kind of go through it as a process, I mean, the last time I jumped with Andy and Evan, like it was fun, man. It was like, I, I remember like looking in the bird and, and I looked across at Andy, look across at Evan and just thinking to myself, like we will, we have all experience in our different career fields, that feeling of camaraderie. And we didn't have to say anything, but it was like, we looked at each other and like, oh, this is awesome. Let's, let's bail out. And it just brings you closer together. I think it's profound. Yeah. I think it's such a good metaphor for life in a way. And I like to use the term circle of awareness because when you do those first jumps, like I remember the first time I was about to go out the door and you have to do simple things. Like what we had to, we had to get out, we had to stabilize, we had to like do a practice touch yeah, and then look at our instructor, check our altimeter and pull. And that was it. And I remember standing at the door and my brain just dumped everything. It was like instinctually, my brain didn't want me to do this thing because it knew like you're jumping out of a plane. Like this is, this equals death. Why would you do this? No, don't think about what you need to do in order to get out that door. It, but <clears throat> that first one, you're, you're just so focused on it, but then you start to open up your circle of awareness. Right. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, okay, now I can think about what direction I'm going and then what other people are doing. And when you look at that experiential in life and how, okay, I want to do a new task, but I'm super scared to do it. And it's a very uncomfortable thing to me, for me to do. And it's very hard to get going and, and you don't know what that's going to lead to. But when you do an activity to where the universe can communicate to you how to be successful just through repetition, just through experience and just by doing it. And when you, you were talking about being adaptable and how important that is, like the probably one of the number one reasons for success at Black Rifle Coffee is because we've prioritized being adaptable, whether that's in social media or being developing an omni-channel business model. And you don't get to those steps unless you start opening your circle of awareness and your experience on what you're trying to do. And you're like, all of a sudden, this thing that is fun jumping all, all of a sudden has all these other life lessons mm -hmm. that you can learn. And you're like, man, if I can do that, what else am I capable of? And just trying to answer that question opens up a really cool track in your life. Yeah. It's a pretty amazing experience and journey. I, I, you know, what scares the shit out of me is, and you have an experience of this Jericho is, is static line jumping <laughs> because I don't want to do it, dude. I, I do it. You gotta do it. my <laughs> last, when I was a team sergeant, which was my, I, I jumped when I was a sergeant major, I had a couple like, uh, what they call proficiency jumps where mm -hmm. you're just maintaining your, your, Pay hurts. your currency. Yeah. And so, my last actual um, operational jump, we were doing a train up at Neglin Air Force Base, and we jumped to C7. I jumped my team C17, and we, we as the reconnaissance element, we were pushing ATVs. Mm -hmm. So we were pushing ATVs um, at 800 feet AGL. Um, with actually, we no the bird went up to elevation, dropped ATVs. We pushed packs. So me and my team pushed first. I was a jumping jump master uh, on, on the door of a C-17. It was at night, and we were going to get out our UTVs. We are going to go to elevation, j push, and then we are going to receive them, and then we are going to do a reconnaissance stuff to receive uh, rapids and fill the assaulters, a whole bunch of verbiage. But I remember the door opening to the C-17, and I hadn't jumped static line in probably a, y a year or two because mm -hmm. uh, free fall currency counts for static line currency. Mm -hmm. And – when I saw the doors open and I saw the tops of the trees and the lights reflecting off the C-17, off the tops of the trees, I literally, as a jumping jump master, whose responsibility this is, a C-17, you, you just go off the lights because they have all the data, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to do anything really. But I, I looked at the crew chief and yelled at him and said, hey, I think we're too low, something's wrong. <laughs> and he's, he made a call and he's like, no, 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 this is, this is right. And I'm like, dude, I can see, I can see the trees. And he's like, no, no, they're tall trees. And I'm like, oh my God. So I got out. And when I got out, um, I was the first jumper out. It's 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. 
I look up, check my canopy, which in the dark, there's nothing there. And I think we were r and like jumping our nods in our shirt. But mm-hmm. for that elevation, we didn't have the ability, obviously, to mount them. And as we came out and I checked my canopy, I hit the ground. Yeah. And it was like, Ooh. oh, my God. And you guys do that crap all the time, all right? That's, that's yeah. your mission. Yeah, it was, it was funny today, actually, Chuck, <clears throat> the 777 and Mike Sorelli. Yeah. He emailed me today, and I just had to send him some jump number stuff. And I was like, you know, this many skydives and then, like, you know, like around 140 static lines and he like wrote me back he's like why in the fuck would you do that (laughs) it's true man you know what though like people and i get that from like all my buddies who are like team guys and stuff about uh, you get better at it like yeah if you do it all the time like it's it wasn't a big deal for me i i knew how to do it to where by the end of my career you know like doing a fucking airfield seizure and like jumping into an airport in the middle of the night at fucking a thousand feet it was like, all right, whatever. On tarmac. Onto an airport, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, and there's and it's like, I always talk to Logan about this, because it's a fucking, like, I get it, it's an art form. And, it, and, like, Rangers are the only guys who do that. And it's like, there's so much institutional knowledge in that little skill set of, yeah. like, Airfield seizure, things. right? Yeah. Rangers are the only ones that do Air Force seizures, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, for, yeah, for the amount of time it takes us to do it. Yeah. 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 And, like... You know, little things like people are like, oh, you land on the tarmac? I'm like, yeah, you fucking aim for the hard stand. Because if you go for the infield, like the, the grass between the, you never know what the fuck is in there. Oof. You know, there's like pieces of, like a 12 inch piece of rebar sticking out of a piece of concrete for no fucking reason. You know, <laughs> like dudes will come, like dudes will come to the assembly area, like with, you know, broken glass. Like I landed on a fucking light or I lit this or that or the other yeah. thing. Like you land on the fucking main runway, there's no weird surprises. It's hard, but. Yeah, you know, you're not going to get anything rammed up your ass. Well, I'll just I'll send videos to Jericho sometimes, and I'll he'll be like, it almost seems like it's part of the training mm-hmm. to drop them in like really shitty environments. Like there's videos of guys just like landing in a giant parking lot, and dudes are like coming down on top of cars. <laughs> Those are my favorite. Oh, there's man. one in the neighborhood. Like this <laughs> this kid landed on like a really tiny second story balcony. I love that one. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah, great, dude. We did. <laughs> Uh, when I was in 275 up at Lewis, you've been up there, right? Like Gray Army Airfield, yeah. right by, we jumped onto that. That was like our practice airfield. Mm. And I don't remember what's it called. CARP, is that CARP DZ? Where like it's a computer automated release procedure or yep, some shit CARP, like that. Yep. So the, the Air Force juxtaposed the winds. So they, you know, like, so if the winds are say going east to west, so then they'll offset their, their, their running heading so that when you come out, you float into the drops. Well, they, they opposited it, like did it opposite. So oh. they went the wrong way and then plus the winds. So the winds pushed fucking everybody off the drop zone. And like That's dudes awesome. were fucking, uh, I landed behind the gym, like the Fort Lewis, like it was called Soldier's Field House. I landed behind the gym. One of our guys landed on our first sergeant's boat in the fucking parking lot. What? Dudes were, you've been at Fort Lewis, those giant tall trees that oh, up God. on Noble Hill. Yeah. Like, so if this is, you know, the tree, guys' canopies were just like, boop. So then they're like fucking 100 feet in the air. <laughs> and there's like not, and you know, like the procedures, if you're, if you're jumping combat equipment and you have to get down from a tree, you like lower your ruck, it's 18 inch lowering line or 18 foot lowering line. So you can like, in theory, climb down that. Yeah. You know, or yeah. you pull your reserve and climb down your reserve. Yeah. But they like, dudes, because <laughs> it took it like, Basically, like, the training mission kind of went off, and then it was like, all right, main effort is now, like, retrieving all these fucking dudes that went yeah. off the drop zone. And you'd go up and see a guy with, like, his ruck hanging below him, you know, but the ruck, the bottom of the ruck's still, like, fucking 60 feet off the ground. Oh, my <laughs> God. Like, so, yeah, they had to get, like, the fucking telephone company to come out with the bucket trucks that, like, you know, went way up, and then guys with those, like, logging spikes to, like, climb up and grab dudes. And then, like, sketchy, fucking, man. Yeah, super sketchy. No one got seriously injured like wow no one it was like twisted ankles and bumped heads that was it that's wow. just good training right there it is yeah. Yeah. my Real first my first jump so me and you know this me and uh, jericho's brother were on the same sniper reconnaissance team in, in b23 in the sif company and my first jump out of free fall school with me and uh one of my guys kurt hohan we went um we we got to uh, uh pope air force base and it was just our team. 
so uh, like seven seven guys, seven snipes. And your brother was with me on this jump, and they they did the jump master procedures, but they were like, hey, at altitude, the winds are super high. I want to say like sixty or something like that, like like sixty knots of Jesus. like violent winds, where you're like, that's insane. But they made the call that we're going to jump because at when, when you got lower down the stack, it started to ease up, and on the surface it was acceptable, but at elevation, it was like super high winds, and I'm like. Uh, this sounds sketchy, but I'm a new guy to free fall. But all the guys, when we came out of the bird, we turned into the wind as soon as our canopies opened. And I was watching my the ground and just race by as I'm flying backwards. So the entire stack starts flying in reverse. So our, 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 our freaking stack is literally flying backwards to get to the drop zone. And your your brother and a dude named Johnny Crocker, who were like free fall gods, because your your brother went to free fall pretty early on in his special operations career in in Okinawa. They were spiraling down. We didn't. Me and Kurt didn't even know that was a thing. Like you pull a riser and you could burn altitude to get down so you can land on the drop zone. We're just riding it. So we're riding it. Finally, at about 500 feet, the winds we start to get a little bit of penetration but it's too late. I'm across the road from St. Mare, the drop zone, mm-hmm. and me and a dude, uh, Ronell, land in a parking lot, and then I look straight up in the sky, and I see Kurt, and he's flying backwards and screaming as he's flying backwards onto a live fire range. <laughs> and we're like, oh my God. And dude, he was literally on a live fire range and landed behind a berm that was doing a live fire exercise. And they saw him luckily. And he landed in the middle of a swamp in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and that was our first jump out of- Fuck, that's a good story. Dude, Je- uh, your brother and, and Johnny were like, oh, our bad. And we're like, dude. And then we actually started asking him like, What's this thing that you guys are doing? Like, why didn't you fucking tell us that you could do that? Like, that's a thing you could grab a riser and burn out to. But it's crazy, man. The the learning curve was was pretty steep back then. Well, I got a good uh, operate the outdoors episode that I want to do with you, and I've told Jericho about yeah. this. But <clears throat> there's so much landlocked BLM land all over the country. Yeah, that there's really no like you just can't get to it. Yep, because there's private land all around. Like we should jump into a oh, landlocked piece of BLM. So rad seven or ten days yeah hunt it yes get picked up by a helicopter self-film it hunt it yeah or just hump out if we could do that yeah you do that that'd be fun dude how rad would that be i want to do the the idea of doing like not behind enemy lines but like in the middle of nowhere unassisted hunts Mm -hmm. where you know there's nobody around that would be dope man that'd be that'd be like a, a dream that'd be awesome what else do you have planned for the operate the outdoors kind of series you're working on so you know there's a my whole the whole concept behind operate the outdoors is the inspire segment of our mission statement you know we educate obviously because we, we have training that we do all over the country uh we, we we try to entertain as well but our our mainstay is the education platform for the first time we wanted to try and inspire people by doing some rad stuff and um you know the idea of going into a, a hunt we don't expect that people would potentially try to replicate that, but that would inspire them to go, man, maybe I'll do a backcountry hunt on my own. You know, yeah. um, I, I also wanted to do, this is crazy. I wanted to do, uh, you know, special operations guys, military guys own the night. And we kind of take that for granted that I'm likely, if me and your brother actually talked about this, most of my memories of war are in black and green. Yep. Because I spent nine combat rotations in black and green night vision and rarely did daytime ops. And and we take that for granted because if you give me if if all three of us put on night vision and an infrared laser, like we'd go to work. Like I almost feel like I can operate better because it's so intuitive for me yeah. than I can in daylight. Because I feel vulnerable, but in night I just know how to operate. I wanted to do a lot of night content, but I wanted to do like like BJ Baldwin or Travis Pastrana, both on the Black Rifle uh, team. You, have you seen what is it called? Um, and you guys just filmed this. Uh, the Jim Connor. Yep. Doing a Jim Connor. Imagine it's like a Jim Connor and the and the rolling door is rolling up, and you think it's like a standard Jim Connor, but then uh, BJ Baldwin drops a set of MVGs, and it's all night blacked out IR on the front of the vehicle. Mm, yeah. 
that would be so dope because uh, people think that special operations guys, I mean, they're talented, no doubt. But the night advantage because of the technology integration and the training that goes with that yeah. is what makes us the best in the world. Like you land on a target with 40 dudes, they all die, you all survive. It's like, how did that happen? Well, we own the night. And there's a whole thing behind that. I, I thought it would be really cool to inspire people to do rad stuff. Seeing, you know, guys are standing outside, and they're like, what's that noise? And then BJ Baldwin, like, whoa, in the dark, like, what the hell was that? Yeah. Yeah. Rad content like that to inspire people to do less on their phone and more out in the real world. Well, it's not that high of a barrier of entry than I think a lot of people think, as far as like, if you can get a set of 14s for what, a couple grand? A couple grand. And then you can, which is insane. You can get some IR floodlights installed on your car. I know, uh, Rich Ryan uh, had his whole, he did a, a huge content uh, thing on his Tesla Plaid that he did. Yeah. And he put a minigun on it, which nobody else is going to do. But <laughs> he, he had the whole thing rigged up so he could do it at night. Yeah. And it, it's not that expensive. Like, you can get some some cheaper floodlights for those things and, and do it fairly easy. Yeah. Um, I actually talked to uh, the Dirtfish Rally guys oh, about cool. doing this. And yeah. They, like, they actually do training for some SF guys out there completely under knots yeah and it's just a huge training facility in the middle of the woods and you talk about having to make decisions on the fly and quick when you can only see what 100 yards in front of you yeah yeah at max it's giving yeah. me flashbacks of like when i was a new guy i was a, a bike chaser for jump clear team and a that was the a bike chaser for yeah so like when you do an airfield seizure we had motorcycles and you would like the first jumper out the door, jump master would push a motorcycle, and then the number two jumper would chase it. And then you go to the bundle, you break it down, you hop on the bike, start it, and then you just drive around and like so cool. You're doing so rad. you're so doing cool. screening for you know you're like screening the perimeter, you're marking obstacles, you're doing like like recce kind of stuff, but yeah. like on a motorcycle. So dope. So I got that. I lucked the fuck out. Like went to a squad that that did that, <clears throat> but you know this was 1998, so. We had PVS seven Bravos, so we would go out two and into do, one, right? That's the Bravo. Yeah, two into one. Yeah, you would do motorcycle training at night on seven Bravos, and it was basically. And my team leader was a fucking demon. Like he was not nice. Yeah. And he would just look at me and be like, "You better fucking keep up," and just vroom, and it's like doing the it's like tank trails, you know, on on base, and it was like dark, dark, light in the middle. Oof. You just point at the Oof. light. Oof. And just and dudes used to fucking crash, man. Toilet paper oh. roll. It's like yeah. literally like looking down a yeah. coke straw. It was, it was, it made your ass pucker, but it made you good. And and then, but then like, the way like so then by the time I left and you know, through the nods we had then you know, like a guy smiles and you can count his teeth, you know, from a hundred meters away. Wow. So like that, having that like progression of technology, and like you said. Fuck, I was so, so, so comfortable yeah. under, under night vision by that time. That's, it, you're right. It's something you kind of take advantage of or you, you take for granted yeah. by the time you leave. Like, holy fuck. I did a couple times, like, as a more senior guy, when I would OC, you know, other platoons and companies, like, exercises and stuff. Sometimes during infill, I would just flip my nods up and turn it off just to get, like, kind of an enemy perspective on and it's fucking scary, man. Scary, dude. Having like three fucking Black Hawks and a Chinook fucking land, and like, dude. you're like, what the fuck's going on? And it's yeah. like, dude, like, like it's not fair. Landing on the X in combat and then being on top of guys and realizing, like, how could this dude not realize, like, an entire task force just landed on his head and slept through it, which I, I find fascinating how yeah. that happens. <laughs> but it, but like you said, like, when you, whenever you, lift your nods and you realize how dark it could be and then all of the abilities of all the individuals and all the assets to bear are all tuned in tonight whether it's thermal imagery or infrared cut imagery you're like dude this is insane like i i've i've had an epiphany where we were walking a target once and i was scanning reeds and you know bad guys in infrared love to hide in palm groves and, and reeds because the infrared light will dissect the blade of grass and, and it will splash you out where you can't, it blinds you essentially. 
And I remember as we were walking, and we were doing probably six to ten kilometer offsets at the time. And as I'm walking and panning and looking for bad guys, the uh, the AC-130 is sparkling uh, with infrared light. Things it thinks are there, and and this is open source. You could, you could find it on the Google machine. But I'm thinking, why am I even pulling security? Like I'm looking for things that I see um, with my naked eye through infrared cut green and, and black at the time. And this guy's using I- infrared thermal technology to identify heat signatures on the ground. Mm-hmm. And he's identifying like, uh, that's something right there. It's like, oh, that's a possum. And you're like, yeah. holy crap. I don't even have to pull security. Like they have me cleared all the way to the objective. Yeah. In fact, it's a liability for me to go, I think that's something. And then tune everybody in. It's like, oh, that's a possum. You, you, <laughs> yeah. you messed up. It's crazy. The technology is insane, man. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Well, it gives you so much respect for the Vietnam guys. Oh my and God. we should we should do a video on this. We Ugh. should we should get some starlight scopes <laughs> and, and go back. Do a and, mock sim yeah, or something. Yeah, and like use the technology that those guys had to use back in the day. Because I I remember at Scout Sniper School they they had one, and I remember yeah. looking through it at night. And I'm like, isn't it like you, it's this huge. big? It's massive. Yeah, it's like 18 inches long, and it weighs like five pounds. It's ridiculous. the thing that Taylor had in the beginning of platoon. Yeah. It it's make, It makes a noise when you turn it on. Yeah. Oh, it's so loud. <laughs> yeah. They, they had, uh, when, uh, my, one of my first gunfights in Afghanistan, we got rocketed and I was looking for uh, uh, the bat, the poo site, which is the point of origin. And I had a, thir- you remember the optic was like a 13 Bravo and it would go, to, it went on a machine gun and we took one and put it, no, it was on, I had a 240. Was it a thermal? It's a thermal. Yeah, it's real black, light, right? Yeah, it's loud. Yeah. And so it's super loud. <laughs> But you couldn't recognize because it only identified heat and black or white. Yeah, and dude, it was so like I was shooting at rocks, thinking it was bad. I'm like, "There's one!" Gah, 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 gah. And it was like, "Ting ding ding!" And, and then, I'm like, "That's a rock." And I remember that too. After you'd put about a hundred rounds through your gun, yeah, it didn't work anymore because the the barrel would just white it out. You'll burn all of them out because yeah. you can't see anything because the heat comes yeah. off the barrel. It's crazy. Talking about the Vietnam guys, though, something I I did as a platoon sergeant was like. You know, you'd go out to like a Mount City or whatever with your platoon and you'd stay out there for like three days, just camping out and just training, like just blank fire training. Every time we did an iteration of that, I would have, I called it the World War II. And we would turn off all our radios and take off our nods and just use overt signaling. Oh, that's awesome. Do it in the day cool. and at night. Yeah. And it fucking makes you way better. Like to yeah. have to use, you know, VS-17 panels, smoke, fucking pen gun flares, and then at night, just pen gun flares and fucking voice recognition and yeah. like phase lines and the plan, all that stuff. Like, really, it, and it also kind of separates the men from the boys as far as like being an adaptive leader and thinking on the fly and being like, uh, I don't know what the fuck to do here. Yeah. It's it's well, a really good ranger school is that right? I mean, yeah. when you're in ranger school, and I, I think at ranger school, um, I went when I was eighteen. You had like one set of nods per squad or something. Yeah, something that's like how that. it was when I went. Like squad yeah. leaders had them, and they usually hung them around their neck. Yeah, they hung around their neck. Like, so you're literally using primal instincts to navigate all your small unit tactics. I, I, like I've been, you know, when people talk about peltors, for example, um, in especially in reconnaissance as a sniper, if I'm on rooftops in the middle of Sauter City, dude, I would I would take my shit off because they're omni was it omnidirectional. Mm-hmm. So you can't identify and pinpoint where specific noises are coming from because you hear a noise and you're like, where did that come from? Well, when you dig off your ears, the peltors, and you hear the noise, and then you cup your ear, like we used to do, what is it, seal, stop, look, listen, listen smell, and smell. And yeah. smell. You could tune yourself in and go, oh, crap, that's, that's somebody right there versus like, what is that? And everybody's paranoid. I think there's something to that. And I, dude, the content around that would be really cool because – you know, that's what those guys dealt with. Like the Smack V Saw guys of Vietnam, the shit they were doing. I mean, uh, uh, John Stryker Meyer, the stories he has yeah. of like hearing bad guys and then being like a couple feet away from them as they're moving by them. That's sketchy shit, man. Yeah. That's sketch. Or like smelling guys. Dude. Like, I smelled them for a day before we saw them. Like, fuck. Fuck, it's amazing. Yeah, that, that feels like real warfare. I almost feel like we cheated a lot. The man in the dude. black pajamas. Yeah, it's crazy, man. <laughs> but if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. It's you know, true. You know? Yeah. That's true. Well, we got this 777 project coming up, and we should probably kind of precursorly 
lay down the law. I don't think that's a word precursorly. You just made that up. Precursorly. Yeah. You took two different words and you put yep, them together. I did that. <laughs> uh, but so I think you, you were, you were in on this before we were, mm -hmm. uh, but do you want to talk about how you got involved in it? And yeah, I, um, well, Andy Stump volunteered my name. Ah, uh, um, Mike Cirilla, um, LegacyExpeditions.net. They had this idea. Mike Cirilla had this idea of doing this world record jump of seven jumps, seven days, seven continents. I think the previous record is like nine months or something ridiculous. Yeah, I yeah. think it's seven. Yeah, seven months total. And the guy that set that is it going with us. Yeah, he's he's doing the tandem. Oh, so for, for oh, Rocky. really? Yeah. Oh, that's rad. I didn't know that. And he's an interesting guy too because he's a huge ad adventurer. He's been he took a submarine down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, which is thirty five thousand feet deep. Oh my god! He said it was insanely boring. I, yeah, I was like, I was like, <laughs> you know, because I'm like, I'm such a movie buff, and uh, like I always go back to I think about the Abyss and, and the Abyss cool, was so rad. How cool oh, that movie such was, a cool movie. and we were so I was picking his brain. I was like, well, what was it like? And all he did was tell us how boring it was and how frustrating it was to deal with how much he had to piss. And that, <laughs> like, so they're in this tiny submersible, right? It's, it's two man. And the guy that he's with owns the submarine. And so he's like, he, the whole time, he's just worried about having to take a piss when he's down <laughs> at the bottom of the ocean. And so they gave him, like, this expandable piss bag. And it was like, it was a kind of a tube, like a kind of large a, IV the, bag. The accordion model. Yeah. Right? Uh. yeah. And so he's, like, he's talking about how they've got like six out. Like they went down and he was like, it was the most boring thing. We didn't see anything below like a thousand feet. Like they saw All black. Like no life whatsoever. Oof. And he was like, there was a couple like little, you know, kind of bacteria looking things kind of floating so around in the like, ocean. Uh, like wet toilet paper kind of yeah. stuff. <laughs> Like yeah, what but, but nothing yeah. interesting. He, like, I completely shucked the idea of ever being interested in remotely doing that at all or going into a submarine. Because James Cameron did it, too, in this, yeah. like, one-man submersible and did a whole, like, cool Titanic, documentary all this stuff, movie right? about it. Yeah. And I was like, that's so interesting to me. And it's, frankly, pretty terrifying to think about going yeah. down to the bottom of the ocean and how many things can go wrong. But he he fills up his, like piss bag and he, so he's got like this it's like three feet long of piss, a piss? <laughs> he yeah it. he's like i don't know what to do with this thing and there's no room in the submersible so he's just like he's just got like this long piss tube bag like sitting on his lap <laughs> for the last six hours in the submersible just holding it the rest of the way that up. sounds miserable yeah, yeah. is but, he is he the is he the idea behind the whole thing you know, that's that's kind of what I was I, I didn't get to that part of the story with him yet. And I was wondering if you knew or not as to the origin of of this in general. Yeah, I think I think Mike Cirillo said they were talking and then they came up with the idea. So I imagine it was probably the combination of them. And, you know, Andy Stump and um, even Mike, all, all of the guys involved are like super profound jumpers in their own right. Right. And I, I think the most important thing they lined out was it was about bringing awareness for some of the veteran issues uh, and raising money to support those advocacy uh, organization that are actually doing good things. I mean, there's a lot of organizations that really aren't doing much, but there's a lot of good organizations that still need the money. And as the GWAT, as we've kind of separated in timeline um, from the GWAT, they're being forgotten. And, you know, doing an epic adventure that's very difficult, but showing that and demonstrating that, the camaraderie, but also what we're doing and raising $7 million. They had me at like, hey, honestly, I honestly I wouldn't be interested in it at all if it was just a, a boondoggle. Like I just would not, if there's no purpose profound to give back, like I don't, I don't find the like the reason to do it. Right, it's gotta have the, the why attached yes. to it, right? And Folds of Honor, is an amazing organization that's helping. Yeah, and it's so cool with Folds of Honor, um, from my understanding, and picking Mike's brain on it. So they started in their primary source of, uh, or what they were trying to do was give funds and scholarships to Gold Star families. Yeah. Uh, but more recently, as GWAT has ended, they opened that up to first responders. So 
in, in this midst of everybody, you know, pushing back support of law enforcement and first responders, they're stepping forward and saying, you know, it's not just uh, military service people anymore. If <clears throat> if someone is killed in the line of duty domestically uh, as a police officer or a firefighter, um, all of these funds to include the $7 million that we're raising for this project is going to Gold Star Families uh, First Responders, which to me is like, after I heard that, I was like, this is amazing and it is worth it. And I, and I hope a lot of people, like, regardless of whether or not you're into jumping or not, like can follow along with this thing and, you know, follow along where these dollars go for these families. It's, it's, it's a pretty cool project and it's an awesome group of people I'm, and can't wait to do it. And I think like the thing that really like turned me on or like really made me into the folds of honor is like you said, like we're, we're a year out now and people have already forgotten, you it's know? Crazy. So there are, there are gold star kids out there that whose dads were killed seven years ago, eight years ago. Just imagine when they're like college age, yeah. like no one's going to give a fuck anymore, yeah. you know? And that's what resonated with me is like, Oh, this is something that can like put all this, put all this money in the bank to continue to support these kids as the years roll on and the public's, you know, sense of, of, you know, support for the troops, like weans as, as years go on, because, you know, yeah, we're not, we're not, it's not on the forefront of people's minds. So it's, I think it's a, it's a really worthy cause to raise a shitload of money for, because they're going to continue to use it. Even though our wars have wound down. Yeah. The ripple effect from this is going to last well, into the next couple of decades. Yeah, I mean, there's kids that were I mean, in their mother's stomachs when their fathers were killed. Yeah. And that's 18 years. You got a timeline of 18 years to support these families. And it's and we shouldn't be firing and forgetting these kids. And, you know, like Michelle Black, who's Brian Black's wife, wrote the book Sacrifice. We're interviewing her soon for the Black Rifle Coffee podcast. And, you know, her husband, um, Brian Black, was killed in Azure Africa, they have kids and those kids need support and those families need support. And the government is not gonna do it. They don't have a plan to do that. And it's pretty sad to see that, like you said, I mean, the 13 American service members that were killed in the shutting down of Afghanistan, you don't hear their names anymore. And, that, yeah. and that's unfortunate. We, got, we gotta keep doing that. And also it's, it's about the awareness factor. It's like that whole media team the documentary style ability of them to tell the story and that it could live wherever it lives for an extended period of time. That's really rad. I I think, you know, it's, it's not just going to be a YouTube video. It's going to be somewhere where people can watch it. People can um, tune into it. And that kind of thing kind of lives on for extended periods of time. And that's going to be important in the future. Yeah. It's this time capsule, right? Yeah. And hopefully, you know, hopefully there's people that watch this documentary, 10 years down the road and they're still moved and to donate funds to folds of honor way, way down the line. And that's what really gets me going is when, when we can have this ripple effect that lasts way, way into the future and hopefully even past when we're still ticking, you know, what does a free fall jump look like in Antarctica? We were watching the videos yesterday. Yeah. So it it doesn't look that crazy. Really? No, I mean, there but aren't a, you at, you're at, so Antarctica, the Arctic will be winter, right? Antarctica is Antarctica will be summer. summer. Yeah. But it's still like negative 30, I think. <laughs> yeah. And then you tack on, what is it, three degrees per thousand feet? It goes three degrees, yeah. yeah. Plus so like, three degrees, yeah. So like, when you exit, dep- like, you know, you're, you're, what they say, it's going to be like neg- negative 75. Yeah, where we altitude, exit. yep. Yeah. So Dude. you can't, we won't be able to jump full face helmets because the, the visor will freeze and like break. So you have to jump like goggles under your helmet. Um, you can't have any real exposed skin. You'll, you'll obviously you'll get frostbite like like that. So I don't know the science Crazy. behind that, but. Can you imagine going to go reach for, and your hand doesn't Doesn't, yeah. you have work? no. That's, that's my. Dude, that. That's why you got a cypher. You got an AED. I'm about to shit yeah. my pants right now. I just, <laughs> just Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, but, yeah. It's gorgeous. Wow. Yeah. Like, seeing the surrounding area of some of these, I think there was, we could only time two videos. We could find we can only find two videos of other of people, people jumping in Antarctica. Wow. And, and they're dead. Both of those guys. Are no, dead. no. <laughs> well, one was about, it was like six, it was five guys and a gal and they, it was fucking awesome. I got to look at that. But, uh, 
Yeah, it's like a kind of like a base camp looking place. A bunch of like, you know, those uh, like summit tent kind of deals. And then just a square. And you just jump into that. But like, if you miss the drop zone, like the whole fucking place is a drop zone. It's like flat as a billiard table. Yeah, so it's, hopefully it's just like yeah. a pillow with a, of snow. Yeah. It seemed like kind of like nice squishy snow about, you know, that deep above the ice. But Nice little pad. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we'll we'll throw the links for the the legacy expedition yeah. stuff in Huge the descriptions, thing. and you know, there's there's no reason to hesitate to to help start throwing funds over there to get to the yeah. seven million. So yeah, legacyexpeditions.net is mm-hmm. the website if you're listening to it. Yeah. Cool, short cool. sweet. Yeah, I love it. Uh, it's perfect commute conversation. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Love you. Bye. Cool. Thanks. That concludes today's training. Any questions? Woo! Drum titties, boy!